welcome to the 20th and anti penultimate episode of the fifth season of the UK podcast. Oh, it's the Ubuntu UK podcast. Yes, it's it is. Tuesday, the 20th of November, and in this episode, we're going to discuss the cult of personality in open source, and we'll interview Kevin Safford about using computers to communicate with his mum. We will, of course, cover the latest news events. Oh, no events. Bits about Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, we've got some of that. Tomorrow's Technology Day, and we'll go over your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website or in the IRC channel. I'm Laura, and joining me tonight are Tony. Hi. Mark. Hello. And Alan. Hiya. <laughs> so, Tony, what have you been up to this past couple of weeks? Uh, I tried Dark Table. I wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago about... Um, my photo workflow on Linux following another guy's blog post where he has he's a professional photographer but he uses a Mac and has been trying to get over to using Ubuntu and I was comparing and contrasting with my own and that was quite popular but lots of people were suggesting try Darktable it's really good um, so I thought I haven't tried it last time a couple of years ago I would try it so I gave it about an hour um, <laughs> well I didn't have a lot of time last night and I had a blog post to write um, <laughs> so yeah I was trying it and it's come along uh, come a long way and it's a lot better than it was it's still not quite uh, what I'm looking for, but is it a photo management app or an editor or it's everything? It's uh, a, a workflow app, so it's part manager and part um, uh, editor and tweaker. It's not the full kind of close digital manipulation things like the GIMP does, um, right? But it's kind of shot well, plus plus plus. Oh, How right. does it compare to Aftershot Pro, which is the is that the one that's you use? The what, that's what I use. Yes, um, it, uh, it's uh, it, it fits in the same niche. Mm. It's not quite got all the features and things that yeah. uh, Aftershot Pro has, but yes, it should fit in that niche. Is it free so, software? It is free, whereas Aftershot Pro isn't. So that's the uh, the motivation for trying right. it. Mm. It's properly for free software. Is it in our repository? It is. Yes. All right. I tried the version in twelve oh four because that's what I'm running on my my work computer, and um, but I, I suspect there's a newer version in twelve ten. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Mm. What have you been up to, Mark? I've been playing games. Um... <laughs> there's a there's a game <laughs> yeah, that I played. New there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a game I played years ago, back sort of when we first got a PC, called um, Star Wars Jedi Knight, which <laughs> was the sequel. <laughs> when I first got a PC, the game was Digger. <laughs> Worm. That's because you're an old man, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, I, I recently discovered that that was actually the second game in the series, and there was a prequel to it called uh, Dark Forces, yes. which you can now buy off Steam. Oh. And uh, if you buy it off Steam, even though it's you know a, a Windows game, you download it and you run it, and it launches in DOSBox. Oh, excellent. We actually, like so it comes. It comes. With it the it DOS ships. Box with, it yeah. ships with a bundled version of the of, of the windowed version of DOSBox and a config file. Nice. So you can download it, and Excellent. then you just download the um, Linux version of DOSBox and point it to the same config file, and it runs. That's so I've been playing awesome. that, which is which is fun. Reliving your misspent youth. Oh, yes. <laughs> Alan? Hello. What have you been up to? Um, I bought a game on Steam on Linux. Ooh. That's what I did. Ooh. Yeah, without wine. Uh, <laughs> get you. So, yeah, the beta of um, Steam started uh, when we were recording last show. And, yes. And, um, yeah, and a load of people have got on board, and um, uh, I actually bought a game, which uh, was quite a you know new thing for me, buying a game in Steam on Linux. Do you normally steal them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I normally buy them on Windows oh. or, or buy the Humble Bundles or something like that. But actually yeah. having the Steam client open and actually using it the way it was intended to be, the way everyone's used it in Windows for years and years and years, using it on Linux the same way. And I just went through the normal process of, you know, buying, put your credit card in and all that kind of stuff, right. download the game, press run, and it works. Like, cool. no faffing around, no, you know, I've got to get this library or got to edit something. It was just, I bought it and then I played it and it worked. Brilliant. And I was happy. Did you do any good in it? Uh, yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even if you say so yourself. Yeah, I, you know, I'm pretty awesome uh, cool. in general, really. How many, <laughs> how many uh, Marios did you get? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question you ask. Okay, isn't it? let's not ask. Laura. He doesn't play many games, does he? <laughs> how are you, Laura? What have you been up to? I'm fine, thank you. I upgraded my laptop to 1210. Not 1010 that you said on <laughs> yeah. Twitter the other day. I knew, the thing was, I knew it was one that I, I pronounced funny. And it's, what, what do you pronounce funny? Well, apparently everything, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but I was upgrading to Quetzal, Quetzal, which I think I called Quick Quack. Right. And right. I, so, but I thought it was Nutty Nahuatl. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sorry, I thought it was what? <laughs> okay. Oh, they were the, I'd pronounce them both weirdly, so I got yes. them confused. Yes, you do. Mm. Yes. And that's why I said on Twitter and that did, I was upgrading to Nitty Norwal. Did the upgrade work? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to report. No. It works. Gim- oh, that's doesn't boring. let me save We like anymore. it when it breaks. Yeah, it didn't break. It just... Is that just because you're using the new version of GIMP where yeah. the save is now GIMP. called export? Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Mendeley has some different buttons. Mendeley. The Mendeley, PDF Mendeley. library. Ah, uh, okay. Cool. Ah, uh, yes. Let's buy it, really. Cool. Cool. Ooh. Everything worked. <laughs> Linus Torvalds loves KDE. No, oh, no, no, he doesn't. No, 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 three, no, yeah. no, two. No. Do we care? He has strong opinions. Is, is the question. And uh, it was a question kind of asked by Aaron Saigo, who posted a recent uh, blog post about the cult of personality in free software. And mm. uh, we wanted to discuss that because it seems quite pertinent that uh, uh, to come at this time when people are talking about uh, the various... Uh, desktops that they do or don't like or features that they do or don't like and whether we should listen to them or take heed of their their tales of woe and whether it's all failing miserably anyway yes so we have reported in this show on the in the past that linux uh, linus has said that he likes a particular desktop environment or doesn't Mm. um his google plus mentions and things like that Mm. um but you know uh, should we actually care he is a kernel developer he is not necessarily a desktop ui engineer and expert well, we should care as much as we care, in my opinion. So the, not the, a lot. The, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, me personally, yes. <laughs> my amount of care is very small. Um, we, we should care as much as we care about anyone. You know, a yes. user. Mm. If a user comes to you and says, I can't use this because this is broken or, you know, I have to use root to enable to add a printer to my SUSE desktop, you know, or whatever it is that he's complaining about this week, um, mm. then if it's... If it's backed up by facts and you know reasoned argument, then yeah, why not listen to him as much as you listen to anyone else? the The problem is it's it's not listening to him as much as you listen to anyone else because he has a huge following and a bazillion people follow him on Google Plus and people hang on every word he says. His opinion seems to matter more than other people. Okay, so. Who should we be listening to in an ideal world? Stephen what? Fry. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. A well-known UX expert, Stephen Fry. Well, actually, it's, it's an interesting example because after we published the Ogcamp video, um, which he did for us, where he said he uses Ubuntu, there was ah, then a story yeah. on OMG Ubuntu saying, Stephen Fry says he uses Ubuntu. And quite a bit of the reaction was, oh, wow, that's really cool. And some of the reaction was, yeah, but what do I care what Stephen Fry uses? And also, his was the most watched video of all of the <laughs> Ock Camp videos, and he wasn't even there. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, I like Stephen Fry and, 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 you know, all due respect and things, um, but it was quite telling that all of the kind of technical talks that were kind of more germane to the business of Ock Camp were kind of really overwhelmed by somebody who wasn't there but is a celebrity, a personality. I'm mm. sure he would hate the label celebrity as, as, as much as anybody. Sure. But, um, you know, but we listen. We listen to what he says, and we, uh, in general, general. Well, it's the general public, yeah. judging yeah. by the numbers of viewers we have on those videos. He also says it in a funny way. It was also that does true. help. We, yeah. I think that video was pimped more than any other. <laughs> I think, I think it was tweeted and dented, and uh, you know, promoted by all of us more than any of the other videos that we made. So that that's mm, partly possibly. why. Um, but I agree with you. I think that. When you have in inverted commas celebrities, you know people who are well known in the public sphere, whether that's well known in the general public, like you know someone like Stephen Fry, or yeah. you know, or people who are known within the kind of insular tech- technical sphere that that we reside in, um, there are always going to be people who not necessarily hang on their every word, but listen to what they say and you know take notice of what they say. If if mm. that didn't happen, then advertising companies wouldn't use celebrities to sell their products. People yes. listen to what celebrities say and what celebrities endorse. So, Whether that's a good or bad thing, that is culturally what happens. You, so, li- sorry, you listen to um, people that you know. I mean, you give people you know more credibility. And I guess celebrities, you feel like you know them even if you don't actually know them. 
It's probably just an extension of that. Yeah, I mean, why why would you follow Stephen Fry if you weren't interested in things he had to say? Or, I mean, we don't have to pick on him. Mm. You know, listen to someone like Robert Llewellyn, who talks, yes. who was Crichton in Red Dwarf, who yes. talks a lot about electric vehicles. Yeah, he's got interesting things to say. If when he <laughs> moans about computing on Google Plus, he gets a flurry of people telling him to use Ubuntu <laughs> or, or, or Linux in general. He's a Mac user, you know, very That's much. That's the way like, to get him across. <laughs> yeah, not really. And, and he does <laughs> complain about the fact that people, you know, dogpile him and tell him mm. to use stuff. So it works both ways. You know, they get to hear from, you know, us what, what we think as well. Oh, for the good old days when the proles were kept at arm's length. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not convinced that it's, it's that much of a bad thing or that it's not something that's endemic in the whole world. You know, you've got TV shows like I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here or, you know, and I'm not saying everyone watches TV, and you know, but, but there is this fascination that people have with celebrity and celebrity culture. And I appreciate that a lot of people who work in our sphere of technology, mm. a lot of them don't even have tellies, don't watch mainstream TV, uh, <laughs> don't, weird. you know, don't, don't this even know, like don't even know who some of these celebrities are. So we'll dismiss that argument. But mm. the fact mm. is there are a huge number of people who are our target audience who do. Yes. And so if you mm. put someone up in front of them who says that desktop sucks, this one's great, they're going to listen. So do you think Linus saying, I don't use uh, something, I don't use OpenSUSE anymore, I'm now using Unity and I think it's great, would have an effect on the number of people using Unity and the number of people thinking it's great? I'm, I'm not sure that when Linus speaks, everyone goes and downloads an ISO image. I don't think it's as direct as that. There um, are a lot of people who say, yeah, I agree. But yeah, it's... I don't, I, yeah, but who equally, knows, yeah, I don't... You don't know yeah. if they're then going to act on that Apparent agreement. If he if he went on Google Plus and said I use Personal Automatic and not you know some <laughs> other brand of of washing powder, I'm not instantly going to throw away all my washing powder and buy another one. Yeah, because I don't value his opinion on how to wash my kids' clothes. You can have yeah. your shirts look as smart as Linus's with <laughs> brand new Daz Auto. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then again, would uh, would people all post saying, "Yeah, I use Purcell as well. It's great because Linus Torvald said it," or would they say, "All right, whatever, man. We don't care." Well, a bit of both, I think, and, and, and that's what you get. You know, well, that certainly but, seems to be the case when you look at Mark Shuttleworth, who's one of the biggest cults in the you know Ubuntu community. <laughs> um, right. Yes. He it writes a blog post and we'll get lots of, yeah, this is really great. Thanks for taking the time to write to us, Mark, and talk to us in the community, us, you know, people down here. Are you, are you, are you being sarcastic about the sycophants who just jump on there and go, oh, thanks, Mark? Yes. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to be clear. But you also get the, oh, this is stupid and ridiculous and why did you do it this way? And whilst you're at it, why don't you fix this, that and the other? Yeah, but you also Put the get buttons back people on the articulating yeah. well, you know, in amongst all of those, you get people saying, well, actually, yes. you know, where's Windicators and why did you move the buttons? And actually, you know, you could have told us about that earlier. And, you know, all these other arguments that, that counter whatever Mark says in his blog post. Yes. And, uh, you know, Mark has a, a role as the uh, figurehead of Ubuntu. And, you know, therefore is supposed to be high profile. He's supposed to have, you know, influence and charisma. Yeah, well, this is this is the thing. In an open source context, quite a lot of open source projects are run by a sort of benevolent dictator figure, of which Linus and Mark are two very sort of clear examples. So it's kind of important that they have the sort of influence that they do where people will say oh yeah that's right because he said it because without that then they're not actually in charge it's, it's not just right because he said it it's right because they're an expert in that sphere so you know if if lina says um you know we should be removing drivers for things older than you know, eight years ago i know he doesn't think that i'm just using this as an example <laughs> then then you know people would engage with that conversation and would yeah. take his opinion as something that's worthy mm. um you know if mark blogs about bees then <laughs> you know some people would value that because he happens to keep bees <laughs> you know it's it's what it's it's not just about is this um, inside information no he's posted on his blog oh right okay. <laughs> he does have bees right? does actually keep bees. <laughs> yeah he does have bees oh, right. um and and so it's 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 more about your 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 experience and your sphere of knowledge so when he does talk about you know design things it's not that you know he just made this stuff up hmm. you know he has actually researched this kind of thing. And similarly, you know, Linus has the experience of using these desktops. So why shouldn't we listen to what they have to say? Hmm. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah, and the, I mean, the personality means that you 
when they come out with that, you sort of trust that. I mean, it's not when Mark does a blog post. Trust. When when Mark does a blog post, he doesn't say, "Oh, here's all the research I've been doing. Go and read it all for yourself, so that you agree with me." Right. The sort of expectation is that because he is Mark Shuttleworth, people will trust him that he's done that bit. Or it's the halo effect, whereby one characteristic for a person that you like, then other characteristics you also like. Mm. Sorry. Technical term. How, how does it work, Laura? Can you explain that to us? <laughs> if you like one thing about somebody, chances yeah. are you'll like other things about them as well. Oh, you say, you Even say, things you would normally not like in other people? Not if it's drastically no, 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 unlikable. Know, yeah. But, you know, say... Um, Stephen Fry says he likes using Mythbuntu. Then you know people who like him for liking computer stuff. They go, "Oh right, he must have he must have something there." And I like oh, I it. see, right, okay, right. yeah. You sort of take it on trust. Do you think? Oh, if he likes it, then it must be okay. I guess so. Right. Oh, okay. The Halo effect. That's not. That's another game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I, I know another Halo effect, but it's not just leaders in like uh, in our projects. It's not just people like Mark and Linus. There, are, there are other people in in the Windows world and the Mac world. And I'm not thinking. I'm thinking deliberately not of leaders, not Bill Gates, not Steve Jobs. People in the communities. You know, you've got right. people like I don't know Chris Perillo, who's very uh, very well known online. And who's he? And yeah, all right. <laughs> um, no, seriously. No, um, it's just someone who's well known online. Right. Yeah, oh, so, right. Uh, oh, well, not not so. for being a part of one of these things. Just he's just a, a he's well known, known for guy. something. Uh, okay. I don't know explicitly what. Okay. But he has <laughs> a lot of people who follow and hang on every word he says. Yeah. And and there are other people like Leo Laporte, who has a long history yes. of broadcasting. Mm-hmm. People listen to what he says, and they mm. you know hang on what he says, and they buy products that he recommends. So it's not just leaders there are there are people who are you know for want of a better word celebrities who yeah. who people follow and they will listen to those things and i and i'm i'm not convinced that it's that bad a thing for us to have some celebrities in our community and for us to listen to them no i agree well what about the um the the issue of <sighs> Sorry, I'm trying to think of, of a politically correct uh, way of, <laughs> of, of phrasing this. Of this is going to be good. In- yeah. Inherent bias of of people kind of being uh, paid if, effectively to put one point of view forward mm. and, and using their influence, peddling their influence to um, lobbyists. Yeah, you know, or, well, you hear on Twitter and the uh, wider pictures about celebrities who are paid to tweet yeah. pro certain things, but you know, the whole kind of influence you get taken out by a lobbyist for dinner or you get taken up to some headquarters somewhere and given a grand day out and you come back enthused for this whatever it might be this technology you but but there isn't the clarity of of seeing that and you can't tell how motivated or what motivates some people who are quote-unquote celebrities or, or you know personalities in the community i guess it just depends how long they go on about it for <laughs> can they yeah, can they sustain that enthusiasm? Month, that contract ran out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I shall no longer be talking about Daz. <laughs> <laughs> but is that sort of thing going to affect open source and free software communities? Uh, what sort of technologies might people be? I mean, you're not going to you know take someone out for lunch to convince them that I don't know um, that file system that Samsung just made is amazing. <laughs> No, but if if companies have partnerships, like you know Red Hat have a partnership with some um, storage company, or you know the the people who work for Red Hat might might be inclined to not blog negatively about that storage mm-hmm. company. And the yeah. same, I'm not saying specifically Red Hat, just you know the same thing could happen to Canonical employees encouraged not to negatively post about you know HP or whatever deal is currently on the cards. You know, it's. Oh, I've noticed a quite a positive tone in your blog posts about HP. <laughs> <laughs> I have never blogged about HP. I don't even oh, blog- the um, micro server, hang on. <laughs> backpedal, backpedal. I like that product. That was Buy one. months ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, hmm. okay. So uh, what are our conclusions around cults of personality? I, I think, don't think they're the worst thing in the world. I think it's inevitable. It's part of yeah. our culture. And I, and I think there's um, a typical reaction from people who aren't... Or, or don't like that part of our culture and, and are kind of sideways from that culture. And that, that's, you know, fair enough. They can have their opinion, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's all bad. Some of it's just fun. <laughs> it's fun to find out what they say and yeah, see I, what other, you know, other people say. Yeah. Genuinely interested to know what desktop Linus uses. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting piece of information. And when he talks about the fact that his 
daughter couldn't or wife couldn't add a printer because she didn't have root access i learned something there i didn't realize that's how they'd configured their desktop and that's something if anyone ever said we should configure our desktop to do that i would say no and here's why (laughs) (laughs) and it's always nice to know that people have the same problems that you have yeah exactly you know we're learning from other people's mistakes and missteps and i i don't think that's a necessarily a bad thing um at all what do you think well, if you've got uh, any thoughts and opinions on the cult of personality, cult of celebrity, particularly in the computing and open source world, you can send them into podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. And now it's time for the news. Oracle has publicly released a Git repository called Red Patch, containing each change Red Hat makes to the Linux kernel as an individual commit. Red Hat recently changed from publishing changes individually uh, to making them available as one large patch, making it harder for competitors such as Oracle to make use of individual changes. Mm, so they've kind of reverse engineered Red yeah. Hat's yeah. patch. It's kind of cheeky and um, kind of flicking the visa at, at uh, Red Hat, I think. Yeah, but equally, it's enough. also it, practical. Yeah, it's something they, <laughs> they've done because it's useful to them internally because they don't need all of the patches for what they're using them for. Right. Um, but then also they can say, ah, oh, look at what we've released uh, to get one over on them. Mm, exciting. <laughs> An Indiegogo crowdsourcing campaign has been launched for PengPod. Is that how we pronounce that? Peng PengPod. So. A new range of dual booting tablets running Android and OpenSUSE-based Linux distribution with Plasma Active, offering a 7-inch device for $120. The project is currently halfway to its $49,000 funding goal in just under two weeks to go. So how does that compare with the Nexus 7 price, $120? Oh. It's cheaper. Yeah, it's cheaper. But the screen is fairly low resolution oh, compared right. to the Nexus 7. Yeah. Okay, well, halfway to... Fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's compared it's a, to compared to some other projects. It's a fairly low goal because I think the guy's basically just getting some fairly commodity hardware right. and shipping it. So he just needs basically money to buy stock from what it, I gather. It's an interesting prospect, and I, I I kind of wonder whether they have the um, enthusiasm because they they the way they describe it is a true Linux tablet and mini PC. And then halfway down it says, yeah, we ship it with Android and a stick that's got Ubuntu on it. Or, or they, you Linux can, on You it. can get it with, um, you can pay like a few dollars extra to have it pre-flashed with Linux. Well, that just sucks. Surely the whole point of the project is um, we're making a one true Linux tablet and then you have to pay <laughs> more to get the one true Linux <laughs> bit. That's taking the mick. Yeah, freedom comes opinion. to the price, my friend. The name, so. the name project has announced that it will be dropping the GNOME 2 like fallback oh. mode from GNOME 3.8, stating that the project is unable to maintain the fallback option at a reasonable quality. Oh, Lots of people were commenting on this uh, article saying, we, you know, we, we liked GNOME 2.8 fallback mode thing. Um, yeah, it's very similar to the old two panel, you know, yes. GNOME 2 desktop of your. Hmm. From the past, some people were complaining. <laughs> some people were complaining that although there were people who were trying to maintain it but weren't able to get their patches in and things, um, you know, maybe that's part of the problem. I think there's already a fork, isn't there, of uh, of that thing? Is it Isn't one of the ones that, that Linux? Thing. One of the ones that, that Linux Mint ships yeah, with? There's cinnamon, cinnamon and mate. mate mate. I think you'll find it is. Yeah, really. Cinnamon <laughs> mate. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, get, a, get a move on, otherwise it won't be latte. Oh, okay. <laughs> VLC developer Jean-Baptiste Kempf has, has completed the long process of relicensing the VLC media player under the GNU Lesser General Public License. The process involved contacting each contributor for consent to relicense their work, and in some cases removing or rewriting code that couldn't be relicensed. That's a massive amount of work. Yeah. Did he get them to sign a general agreement? Well, yeah, this is the thing. A lot of projects, um, particularly like projects in the Apache Foundation, when you contribute to them, you actually, you don't just license them your code, you give them your code. PHP did that to deal with this, didn't they? I'm not sure, actually. I'm not Sorry, sure how it works. On. But yeah, so rather than just them keeping their copyright and licensing it to them under a license like they've done with VLC, um, it means that the Apache Foundation and have control. So they don't have to, if for some reason they decided to like update the apache license they wouldn't then have to go to every contributor whoever 
um, contributed to each of their projects and say, is this all right, like this guy just had to do. Doesn't this open the door for um, VLC to go into stores, uh, app stores, where the GPL is uh, more difficult to use, like the Apple I app store? I guess this was part of the rationale behind it. I didn't really read all of that, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly how Because under LGPL, you could put it in the app store and it would... The, it, the license would be compatible with the store restrictions. How oh, would it? Yeah. Okay, then. Cool. That could be why. Mm. Google has launched Ingress, a mobile game based around real-world locations. The game is currently in closed beta, but invites can be requested from ingress.com. Who's got one? Yes! <laughs> of course, no. yeah. Unsurprisingly, despite not having an Android phone. I think p- previous Ubuntu UK podcast presenter Simon has uh, yes. an Ingress thing. He has it as well. He's been running around like a lunatic. So what do you yeah. do? You go outdoors, which is a oh, big God. stumbling block. Yeah, Where's that? Yeah. It's raining today. It's the big blue room. You go, <laughs> <laughs> you, you go out there and you, you... The big light. You find portals and you take over those portals. You hack the portals and, uh, yeah, you hack the Gibson or something. And, um, I'm sorry. Get yes. arrested for that. <laughs> and huh? and there's, there's two factions and you fight against each other. And uh, But it's, it's an augmented reality thing. So when you walk outside and you go... It, it, I was going to say, this is a different world than the one I've been in. You, you go out there and there's like, um, it's, very, it's very popular in built up areas where there's like. Um, it's based around like artworks, artworks and sculptures and things, like and, th- and things like that. So you go to the monument and you hold the phone up and you hack the, the thing virtually on your phone. Basically, and, London. Uh, and other major cities okay. as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's some in Southampton as well. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Well, we've got lots of hackers there, so yes. that would make sense. Yes. So, how, what do you hack? Hack? Well, you're so, it's sort of there's two teams competing against each other for control of each portal, and there are these portals placed where there are artworks. So you have to physically go to the uh, and be in the proximity of the artwork or the, the whatever it is. It's not just reading the a portal is. QR code or something. No, no, you have to physically go there. It detects your proximity, and then you can hack it when you're within sixty meters or something of it. And uh, once you've done that, you join them up and you know get into yeah. fights with other people. Yes, all that kind of good stuff. It's interesting, and it. Sounds quite good fun, actually. Yeah, and it, as, as I said, it's outdoors, which is, you know, good. Tchaikovsky calls it QR codes plus plus. <laughs> oh, no, not QR codes. <laughs> Finally, Google has added a clause to the Android SDK license agreement requiring that developers agree not to take actions that may cause or result in fragmentation of Android, including creating an alternative SDK derived from the official one. Is this a bit evil? Sounds a little bit easy. Don't use mm. our product to make a competing Better product. product. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was after there was a recent um, story we talked about where another company had taken a fork of Android. Yeah. Right. And you could run Android apps on it, but it wasn't Android. Right. And mm. they didn't like that. No. So, oh, it was Asus, wasn't it? So, kind of doing the yeah, open source they, thing. They cease and desisted them. Uh, Amazon basically do the same thing, don't they? With. Um, Kindle Fire. I don't think so. I think that is Android that with is a skin Android, on top, with a thing on top, so and you can't get to the underneath down. guns. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't know if it was that or an actual fault. It's, it's so actually what? surprisingly common in SDKs. There are other SDKs out there where you, you know, non-free ones, mm. where you can't use the SDK to create a competing product for the SDK. Interesting. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the end of the news. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire. So, my doyen of the domestic, by which I mean my delightful co-host, Miss Deirdre Morris Oxford, what sort of technology can we expect tomorrow? Or possibly the day before that? We are speaking today about the dire possibility of war, Douglas. Major world powers are considering harnessing the explosive power of the atom in a process called nuclear fission. The only fission I know about is trout fishing, Deirdre. Splendid lakes in Scotland. Let's speak to the head of British Atomic Research, Professor Hubert Mugtree. Good day, Professor. Good day, Deirdre. Just what are you researching? By enclosing fissionable heavy elements in a combustible sphere to produce a chain reaction, we are attempting to construct a submolecular implosive explosive device. You mean an atomic bomb? That's a gross oversimplification. Yes. And how is it progressing? 
If all goes well, the British Empire will possess the first weapon capable of flattening an area the size of the city of Birmingham. And if it doesn't go well? We shall probably flatten the city of Birmingham. No harm done then. Not now, Douglas. So, Professor, when do you expect to build this atomic bomb? As soon as we've mined and enriched enough of the rare isotope, uranium-235. Is that up your anus? Not now, Douglas. But according to our calculations, we need about two tons, so in approximately 150 years. Well, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought we were facing Armageddon. We can all rest easy knowing that only another conventional world war with Germany poses any threat to the Empire. And Herr Hitler will never contemplate that. So breathe a sigh of relief, Birmingham. You're safe for now. Professor, are you sure you need two tons of uranium? The German figures have proved it. Absolutely. No question. Possibly. Would you care to come over for a spot of tiffin, my dear? It seems I've got about 150 years to wait for my experiment to finish. Really, Professor? What sort of physicist do you take me for? Um, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. A toodle pip and God save the king. talking to Kevin Safford who's been uh, making a computer for his mum who lives uh, about 200 miles away? It's about 100. 100 miles. So it's not an easy drop in. It certainly isn't. So do you want to explain briefly what the computer is and why you why you decided to make it? Yeah, I went for um, a small uh, ARM-based plug computer which um, is sort of known as a dream plug I think on account of the um, screen that comes with it. So it's a, um, a computer that's literally sort of the size of my hand, including the power supply unit, and uh, a 10-inch um, USB touchscreen to go with it. I wanted um, that sort of setup because I wanted to run something Linux-based um, for administering remotely. And I wanted something that wouldn't be too obtrusive at my mum's. I didn't want a, a hulking great desktop or a laptop that would put her off. So uh, this matches uh, this matches the bill quite nicely. So how much does she actually interact with the tablet itself? She doesn't. I mean, that was one of the things that I probably should have thought through a bit better at the start. I um, asked on, on the local uh, log for advice on touchscreen support uh, with Linux and found that there wasn't much unless you went for a USB solution. At the time, I, I thought that this was pretty critical, um, but it turns out not to be so because my mum doesn't really uh, drive the thing at all. I, uh, I drive it, so I could have got away with using something more conventional. What, what were the initial requirements? Was it your mum came to you and said, what's this new fan, fangled computer internet thing? Or was it something, what, what prompted you to do this? Yeah, no, good question. My mum's got Alzheimer's, um, so she's um, lost quite a few abilities uh, to do day-to-day -day tasks. She, she struggles, for example, to uh, make a phone call now. Um, I have to tell her how to switch the TV on and off. And I sort of semi-jokingly thought about getting a webcam fitted up for some time so that I could keep an eye on her. It was actually the Alzheimer's specialist that gave me the idea for uh, doing a webcam plus. So um, I, um, uh, I floated the idea to my mum. I put it forward to explain what I wanted to do. And um, she was uh, she was very supportive. She was very keen on it. So it was mainly for a, a, a peace of mind for you rather than um, a, a utility for her? No, that was the initial thing. And it's interesting, sort of, um, I've done a bit of Googling on it, and that seems to be the starting point for a lot of people, that, yes, you can see um, the, the person that you're you're caring for. But I've taken it a lot further than that, and I actually think that the peace of mind for me is a nice bonus. The main um, 
good points about this so that it enhances the quality of life of my mum. Right. And what what does she actually, um, you know, I, I'm imagining not a webcam in the corner of the room just, you know, yeah. for want of a better word, spying on her. I'm, what, what does she actually do on a daily basis with it? Okay. Well, she sometimes, I, I, um, the, the, the webcam thing, we use video chat. So I'll mm-hmm. sort of uh, VNC in to the thing and call, call her initially from my end so the bell rings at her end to alert her to the fact that there's an incoming call and she'll come and sit down in front of it. And then um, I go through to uh, her computer and ring myself and answer it. And then we just talk. And all mum needs to do is to to sit there, um, look at me, um, which is uh, no doubt really pleasurable for her. (laughs) (laughs) Then we have a chat. And the chats have been um, a a lot richer than than they were just audio. I think having that, uh, that visual dimension adds something to it. So uh, we've, we've got that side of it. I've done some other things as well, using a combination of sort of Perl scripts and um, cron jobs. So, for example, she gets um, a message that comes up every day, uh, first of all, to tell her what day it is, and then to tell her uh, what she's got on for that day. Um, it's done through uh, an HTML page, and it's in a nice big um so that she can see the thing. The web page is constructed on the fly from a combination of uh, sort of static information um, because Tuesdays, um, for example, she tends to do the same thing every Tuesday and um, a structured text file that will let me put in one-offs for her. So I think that's uh, that's useful for her. She, it, it reassures her as to what she's got to do. One of the things that she would say quite a lot was, I'm confused, I don't know what I've got to do. So um, I, I think that uh, that has definitely helped. So a lot of people would think, you know, a computer for my mum, I mean, traditionally, my mum has never had a computer and now now she has one and she uses it for what you would traditionally use a computer for, um, you know, Facebook and email and you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. I guess your mum's use case, what with, you know, her condition, she she doesn't need email or do you do you not have any other applications for want of a better word on there it's it's mainly a communication device for you oh, it, um, it, you pretty much um, get email forgiven um, when uh, when you sign up with an ISP so she's got a virgin media email account mm-hmm. she's got uh, a gmail email account because I thought that um, uh, Google talk or whatever they're now calling it, was going to be an option for us to do. But that wouldn't play nicely with uh, the ARM processor. So she's got at least a couple of uh, email accounts that she's blissfully unaware of, like (laughs) redirected to me um, in the event that there's anything she needs to look at. So the the issue with um, not being able to use Google Hangouts and other proprietary... Uh, plugins is because you've made the selection of having a, a low cost low power yeah. arm device yeah basically i think um it's um it's running debian squeeze and the browser on it is uh, i think a back level um, mozilla um and i just couldn't uh, install the um uh, the the the, uh, the plugin to yeah. get the talk thing working. I don't, I don't think it's available for ARM. But we we've had similar issues on ARM devices as well. well I've been able to work around it. I've um, I, I've got Ekiga, um up and running at both ends, and that uh, that that seems to work okay. So I was good for that. And it's been an interesting learning experience actually for me. It's really made me appreciate the benefits of. Um, the Libra bit of uh, a floss of free uh, Libra open source as opposed to the free and bare bit. Um, you know, I mean, some of the uh, commercial um, software makers, such as Dropbox, I told you the idea of doing that. And I, I, there was another one that won't run on ARM out of the box. But they do at least make the um, source available. So... Uh, if if I decide that I want to bite the bullet, I, I could compile it and run that on them. So 
Uh, so you've truly been bitten by the proprietary stuff not working on ARM, but you, you're using Akiga as the as the soft phone. Yeah, that's right. And do, is there any particular webcam you're using, any other hardware you're using with her ARM device to... Um, what did I do? I got um, an all-in-one for about 16 quid from some very nice people in Singapore, the, <laughs> the webcam um, mic and speaker. Mm. It's only a mono speaker, but uh, it's more than adequate for what my mum wants. One of the other things that I do on it is to play music for her. Uh, twice a day, so I've stuck um, uh, some OGs and MP3s and uh, and so on on uh, on her um, drive, mm-hmm. and I've got a couple of scripts that um, play these uh, or play a selection for her twice a day. <laughs> what, what's the uh, rationale for that? Is it to to get her in tune with what time of day it is, or to uh, it's it's more sort of quality of life, really, um, uh, something out of the ordinary. I mean, left to her own devices, she'll sit and watch Sky News um, 24 hours a day, which is so depressing. It's uh, it really, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, wow. it's on half an hour loop, and uh, oh, yeah. and you've got the thing going continuously. So it's an attempt to to get out of that. Um, so again, that was an interesting thing because of the, um, the the limited spec of the computer that I've got. I had to do a bit of digging um, for something that would play nicely without taking up a lot of system resources, and I came up with Mock P um, to uh, to do it, which is a, a text-based thing. Um, nothing flash, no skins or anything like that, but it does the job. It works absolutely brilliantly. So if somebody else wanted to do this, um, how easy do you think it would be or is your particular setup so customised to you that you'd then have to start from scratch? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't start from where I did. I mean, I'd... <laughs> <laughs> the traditional answer, yes. But yeah. Um, I'd, um, I'd start, uh, depending on the, the level of expertise um, uh, and uh, time and that available to people, I think the um, the concepts behind it are not difficult. Uh, I'm actually making available the scripts that I've done um, at work, and um, I will uh, hopefully sort of publish them outside of that. Um, it's. I think the the big thing, if it were going to take off, and I, I hate to say this on an Ubuntu. Uh, <laughs> It would need, shall we say, um, making available for uh, for, for different uh, platforms and other <laughs> systems. Mm. Right. Let's and, leave it there. Uh, well, no, I can, I can see the. What was the 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 uh, decision about choosing the the thin arm device? Was it just cost or power or what? Why? Because that seems to have it, driven some it, of your decisions. I think yeah, I, I, I got it a bit backwards, I think, on that. Um, it was, like I said, I think the primary reason was the size of the thing, that I wanted mm, something right. that would fit in my mum's uh, machine, uh, in my mum's living room, because it's important that it be somewhere where um, where she is for most of the time. I don't want it tucked away, otherwise mm. she'd never see these notices that I'm putting up. That say, right. if, yes, if that makes sense. So, so. so um, and I'm given mum's age group there's uh, there's a lot of ornaments and, and things in as well so it's a sort of uh, balance in that so there's maybe a, a gap in the market for something that looks like a uh, an ornament but is actually carriage clock yeah, can, can it be I, mean, no, I mixed up with um, uh, Virgin as the ISP and uh, I, again I had sort of similar decisions about where, oh, where to put the modem yeah. and she really liked the look of the um, uh, yeah. the, the super hub that it's quite cool. Yeah. The nice blue light. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much what she said. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you go about um, remotely connecting in? And uh, is it just a case of you know because you're an expert, you can just use SSH and you know you're all nice and secure? How do you how do you deal with those kind of aspects? Don't, don't call me an expert. No. no. <laughs> um, yeah, I SSH in, and um, most of the time I'll, I'll export the display. 
Um, and uh, then if I want to, um, I don't know, do, uh, uh, do something that needs uh, an X program, I can run it without the full overhead mm. of running the, uh, the desktop. Right. Um, I, I uh, restrict the uh, VNC really to when I want to um, uh, sort of thing throughout with my mum over the phone. It's had um, an interesting side effect for the way that I personally use uh, Linux because I come from um, MS-DOS originally then through various shades of Windows. And <laughs> when I went on to um, Ubuntu uh, Hardy, I tended to use the uh, the GUI way of doing things. With connecting remotely, I'm um, much more at ease with uh, using the command line now. So for setting up cron jobs and that, I, I've got no problems uh, sort of doing a cron tab minus E to get it done. But I feel really good about that. Mm. Yeah. So um, is there, now that you've you've got this set up as it is, is there something more that you'd like to do with it for the future? of other bits um, done on it. So what I mentioned, I've mentioned the um, uh, the music, the notices. Um, I run some photos for us, so it's oh, a yeah. of photos uh, once a day. Uh, again, a, a low overhead thing, FEH, um, which lets me put captions on them. So mm-hmm. most of them, oh, cool. they look at them and see um, what they are, because she's She's forgotten quite a lot, you know. Mm. She'll see a picture of a house where uh, she grew up as a child and not remember where it is. So it's really good if she can uh, can see these things. Um, and I grab podcasts uh, for her. I'll probably stick this. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have great fun um, but again because of the, um, uh, the the preponderance of Sky News. I try to get the carers to put it on to put the TV on to something else. Mm. Um, but I didn't want her to lose the news altogether, so um, I grabbed the uh, a, a podcast from the BBC that's a compilation of uh, world and, and UK news uh, during the weekdays, and I've stitched onto the front of that the Chimes of Big Ben, so it's a seven oh, o'clock kind of... <laughs> Wow. There, and it, uh, it goes bong, 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 and then starts playing the news to us. <laughs> Brilliant. Has, has there been, um, have you had conversations with, I, I appreciate that, you know, this might be a difficult question to answer, but have you um, had conversations about how this has improved or have, have you, is there any measurable way that you can say your mum's life is better for having these things uh, done for her? Um, not measurable, I wouldn't think, um, although all the sort of anecdotal evidence and, and uh, remarks neighbours and my observations of it right. helped. Mm. Um, and mum herself tells me that uh, that she enjoys it, that she likes it. Excellent. Are you uh, looking for help in making it, yeah. like, developing it further? So yes, I am. Um, I, I'm working on that uh, at, at work. I want very much to, uh, um, to, to, to get this out and sort of make it known that this can be done. Mm. It surprised me, actually, because nothing in it is, is revolutionary or particularly new. It just seems to me that um, people haven't had the idea of doing this. It's putting it all together, isn't it? That's right, yeah. And what would be really nice um, is uh, to, to, to get someone that's a lot brighter than I am working on um, something that would cover the bulk of uh, the, the user base and that would let them just plug something in and go. So port it to Windows or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, where would somebody contact you if they wanted to find out more? Yeah, I've got a, um, a Twitter account uh, at, the, at the moment. I think it's Kev Saf um, uh, is, is my Twitter ID. So that's probably the best one. Okay. You can email me at um, kevin.safford at gmail.com. Okay, we'll put a, well, we probably won't put a link to your email address. We'll put a link to the Twitter account in <laughs> yeah, the we'll show notes. we'll put a link to your Twitter and they can yeah. get a hold of you that way. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. No, um, for, I'm so grateful for the, the chance to tell people about this. Great, thank it's you. It's been lovely to hear about it. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. Cheers, Cheers then. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.
It's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Yes. yes Smooth. Yes. <laughs> and the first bit about Ubuntu, uh, a stable release upgrade is being worked on to back for backport UEFI Secure Boot support to 1204, allowing the latest LTS release to continue to work on new Windows 8 certified machines. This is good, isn't it? It is. It is. is. As people will be able to buy them now. Yeah. And because 1204 came out before all the Secure Boot stuff was finalised, mm. um, the ISO yeah. images that are out there at the moment don't work with uh, Secure Boot machines or may not work with Secure Boot uh, certified machines. Or you need to at least poke around in the BIOS to get them to work. Possibly, yeah. yeah. I've never played with one, so I don't know. No, but I've not seen one either. At the beginning of next year, um, there is a new respin, a new point release of 1204, 1204.2. And from that point onwards, 1204 will be uh, supporting those kinds of pieces of hardware. It's weird to think there are computers that won't have a BIOS. I mean, the BIOS has been around longer than any operating system. There are, there are a lot of computers from one manufacturer that don't have yes, a BIOS. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. and haven't had for, well for know, a very long time. So what do you have if, if you don't have a BIOS? We well, have UE, UEFI. Yeah, 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 but UEFI. what's that if it's not a BIOS? Uh, hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. It's a it's a firmware, it's a BIOS but it's not name. it's not like the traditional BIOS where you you know press Dell during setup and get into a funky screen for. I don't think I've ever pressed Dell. Or F1 oh, or you a function. Well. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> if, 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 you've never, if you've never changed your boot sequence, you haven't lived. Mm. Yes. Have you never I've had done to that. Tweak? Yeah, that's I've just never pressed Dell. Well, a button. F2. Though. It's different on different computers. I know it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm ignore you, troll. Yeah, troll. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore the haters. Yeah. Uh, Rick Spencer, director of Ubuntu Engineering, has blogged about the road to the next LTS release, which is going to be fourteen oh four. Yes. Following on from the UDS at uh, uh, somewhere in Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Yes. Cold. Uh, with expensive <laughs> cold, beer. Cold and expensive, yes. Um, yeah, so he's been writing about the things that are going to uh, be coming along for 1404 and what they need to do to get there, mm. more crucially. Um, quite a range of things. The vision is that it's going to be robust, fresh, easy Excellent. to make, easy to make and ubiquitous. Mm. 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 Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of detail. It's quite high level, uh, but there's a little bit of detail in there about things like... Um, uh, doing phased updates, uh, which, yes. Uh, the use of something called autopilot, which we use. You spoke about that old cam, didn't you? Internally, yeah, briefly I did. Yeah, auto autopilot. Yes, which I've been using today. Um, yeah, we use autopilot to do automated GUI testing, and um, so yeah, that's all rather that good. And whole kind of build build infrastructure around the way packages are. We build and test tested before they even get to testing. Well, we already tested them anyway, but <laughs> this, yeah. th there's a lot more automation in it um, now, so that a developer can, you know, push their change uh, into Launchpad, and then automatically a job picks that up, packages it up, and then does a whole load of testing on it. Mm. Uh, and some of that will be tested on real hardware, so it'll actually uh, boot a machine, start a new version of unity or whatever it is that the developer has changed and automate a whole load of tests and only if a certain percentage of them pass will it actually come through into the distribution brill yeah it's really cool there's loads of other stuff in uh, in um, rick's blog post as well like uh, sandboxing applications uh, application isolation stuff like that with with app armor security team are working on and that's a quite cool and a picture of Sam and Al from Quantum Leap. Yes. Which is quite cool. <laughs> yes. I'm not quite sure why that's there. <laughs> but never mind. Version 2.0 of the Ubuntu Code of Conduct has been released. Does this mean we have to upgrade? <laughs> no, it's just, it's assumed you, you, you will. Ah, is there, is there a clause saying you agree <laughs> to You agree to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then we put loads of evil stuff in there yeah. and you've agreed to that. So we, you're, you're bound by that now. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever signed it. You don't have to go oh. around and ask everybody individually. No. Um, so, yeah, some changes were made and mm. um, merging numerous documents together. Uh, some work that Laura Tchaikovsky has been doing on the Community Council. So this means there's only one code of conduct, yes. not one. separate ones yeah, for different we, roles. We used to have like a code of conduct and a leadership code of conduct. Oh, and right. now it's just <laughs> one document. And there were some things that people found objectionable in that and we took those out and reworded large chunks of it it's you know if you if you look at the diff between the old one and the new one it's just basically the whole document's been rewritten so um yeah it's good 
Cool. Excellent. So will people have to re-sign that when they renew their Ubuntu membership? I'm not sure, actually. I don't know. You'd have to ask Laura. Okay. She's in her IRC channel. I'm sure yes, she'll be frantically Laura. typing now. <laughs> Give her the 10 second delay. Um, yes. while, while she's typing that, I will talk about Ubuntu Community Appreciation Day, which is happening. When's it happening? Yay! Today. That means people appreciate Today. us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Appreciate well, your local no. Ubuntu community podcasters. Oh. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's us. Yes. Right. Laura says we don't need to resign. Free sign. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, yes, it's a bunch of appreciation today, and some people are being appreciated on the internet for it. Oh, okay. And finally, in Not About Ubuntu, the GNOME project is seeking, seeking a new community manager to help the project relate to its user base and to avoid too much controversy around decisions that are made. Like dropping fallback mode? <laughs> yes. So, yes. GNOME 3.8... Mm -hmm. Is that basically a lot like Unity, or is it completely different? Well, GNOME 3.8 includes GNOME <laughs> Shell, which is the desktop, and loads of other components underneath that that support that, like GTK and other stuff. Okay, if I were a dumb user and I yeah. looked at a 3.8 laptop screen... A, a machine that was running GNOME 3.8, right? Would that look like Unity? A bit. Yeah, a bit. It would have a thing across the but top a bit less and purple. buttons down the side. Okay. And it would have a thing when you launched it with all the icons, kind of like the dash. Yeah. But not oh, quite. So it, there, it, it there, are similar, similar, quite similar. Similar. there are some similarities. Where they differ is... Uh, <laughs> well, the, there's, there are differences. There's, a, okay. there's more of a pluggable architecture with, with no yes. shell. You can write like little JavaScript plugins for it okay. to add features and stuff like that. Hmm. Mm. Just, Just curious because I've never seen it. One thing I've just noticed on this job description here for the GNOME community manager says, must be good at shutting stable doors once the stables are empty. I don't, <laughs> I don't know quite what that means. Excellent. It is time for your feedback, and first out of the bag this week, Andrew Turner emailed us. Someone at the Oxford English Dictionary listens to your podcast, or is an Ubuntu uh, 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 listen to your podcast, or is an Ubuntu user, or both. On Saturday, the Oxford English Dictionary website's word for the day was skunkworks. Surely, no coincidence. Absolutely, Absolutely. our reach is far and wide. Mm, yes, this well, is after we talked about the Mark Shuttleworth Skunk Works project uh, a couple of episodes ago. I think. And I, yes, it was, uh, which is still ongoing. And um, invitations have been sent out. And there's now uh, mm -hmm. on the wiki there's a document for. Um, it's kind of a code of conduct. It's like a, a few bullet points of how <laughs> it. of how we would. Well, it's very different because it's um, about you know keeping a few things. This uh, is this is the not an NDA behind. Yeah, the not an NDA, but it's a bit like one in that right. we're asking you nicely. You know, <laughs> yeah. please don't reveal what's behind the curtain until the big reveal. Have we got a collective noun for these people yet? Are they skunks? Skunk. I think skunks? they're skunks. Right, yeah, okay. I think they're skunks. I you know, interestingly, I, I didn't realise what skunk where the skunk works derived from oh. and um apparently is a trademarked term oh. <laughs> the term skunk works really? it's uh yes yeah, is it lockheed i think in the states they they set up a thing called skunk works where they worked on these kind of projects right. internally and um it's it, it's well, existed for years originally mm. i think it's like there was a bit of cer certain works that went on in some factories where people tended not to go and visit because the work they something to do with um certain electronic components where the stuff they're working with smelt really bad, which is why it's called a skunk works. <laughs> Thanks, Wikipedia. Yes. Which Lock then, Lock Lockheed, yeah, then Lockheed yeah. mm. appropriated the term ah. for sort of secretish projects where right. people didn't go and interfere. Where people smell. Oh. How appropriate. Indeed. <laughs> Paul Dart tweeted to ask... How many of the creatures in release names are on the vulnerable or critical threat of extinction list? Just something I was thinking... There was a thing about mm. Lucid Links, wasn't there, when they released that? Yes, and giving money to a uh, Lynx charity. Yes. And narwhals. And I things. worry more about the jackrabbit. Yes. You don't see many around, do you? you don't see many jackalopes around. No, you these, don't. Isn't there? No. no. Yes. No. If you've seen a jackalope, why not? <laughs> Send us a picture. Uh, super engineer mentioned in our IRC channel. John O'Bacon tweeted, It is amazing to watch the journey of a fart illustrated by your baby's face. Are there any similarities to the release cycle? <laughs> no comment. Absolutely. 
Um, it does give us opportunity to congratulate Jono on his new baby. Yes. And Erica, of course. Yes, Monsignor John Edward Bacon or something, isn't it? No. Uh, that's Jedward. Jack. 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 Jack Taylor, Bacon, I think. Yes. Jack Taylor. Jack, it's Bacon. just so you can give him a ball. Ah, uh, uh, that's very good. The theme of Lug Radio is called Jack's Playing Ball. Oh, uh, yes. Wow. You're a massive Lug Radio fan girl, aren't you? No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just quick off the mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, where you can find our voicemail numbers and Twitter feed, Facebook and Google Plus pages, and our IRC channel. So plenty of ways to get in touch. There's just no excuse. <laughs> Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community that makes it. Join us on Tuesday the 4th of December. Yay. And for our next live broadcast, the penultimate episode of the season. We're Ooh. going to have some time off again, are we? We're going to have Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I don't know about we're the rest not, of you. We're not broadcasting over Christmas, live from your lounge. On Christmas Day. <laughs> on Christmas Day. Maybe oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for dinner. We should put yes. out a special <gasps> Christmas Day. Tony's, Tony's speech. <laughs> <laughs> the Queen's speech. I think, <laughs> I think I might resent the implication. <laughs> Are we doing something special for Christmas on the show? Ooh. Oh, yeah. I, I think we are thinking. Oh, of course we are. Yes, it's all Keep well listening planned. to find out more. Yes. Um, <laughs> what we think of it. Yes. So two more episodes left and then that'll be it for the year and then we'll think about so, coming back. And then so maybe we'll you don't need, sell all the equipment and never do this again. You don't need to email us two weeks after Christmas asking where the show is. We, we're warning Indeed. you now. Yes. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.